With weeping they shall come, and consolation will be their guide. Between the words that are spoken and the words that are heard, may we encounter your living word. Amen. Today, we hear a gospel story that seems to be in place only to make sure that we know where the story is moving. Today, we hear a story of Jesus and his family, this new family, fleeing from place to place, trying to find safety. Why are we talking about this today? We've arrived at Christmas. This is meant to be a joyous time, but maybe I have that wrong in my head. Instead of bells and angelic light, we hear rapid warnings from an angel. Get up, take your wife and child, flee here. No, wait, flee there, wait, go over here. Each time with an instruction that tells us this is happening because. It occurs to me that this is something that's going on in all of our readings today. The prophet Jeremiah is also speaking to a people that are fleeing or at least attempting to return from a place that they have fleed. They're looking for reason. They're looking for hope. They're looking for joy. And yet the thing that they feel is fear. With weeping, they shall return, and consolation will be their guide. It occurs to me that this second Sunday of Christmas, we might all have a better understanding of the voice that we hear in our gospel. We might have a better understanding of the voice we hear from the prophet Jeremiah as well. You see, we are also dealing with fears of our own. We are fleeing, are returning as best we can, and we are but a remnant of what we once were. We've experienced losses that seem to have mounted, and in the midst of that, we've looked for reasons why we must endure these things. We, like the voice in the gospel, have looked for the way to say, And this has happened because, fill in the blank. I wonder sometimes if that serves us well, perhaps particularly in this moment. In order to think more about this, I kind of moved back to the reading from Jeremiah and thought about what it must be like to be a prophet speaking peace and joy and reconciliation in a time of such great upheaval, in a time where doubt seems such a reasonable thought. And here I'm reminded that so often as we look for a God that makes sense to us in our lived experience that we project so much onto God. The words we use matter in this sense. What does our God need to be for us in a time when we are afraid? Well, if you look closely in Jeremiah, you will notice that God is described in so many ways to this remnant of Israel, this group of people that have been scattered and gathered again. And perhaps that says something to us about our understanding of trauma in our lives, of how we make sense of the things that have hurt us along the way. Today, we are invited to see God as a shepherd, a shepherd gathering this loose flock and bringing them back again. And in front of that group are those that are otherly able the ones that are pregnant, that are sick, that are old, and young children, that that weakness is what is leading them back in the eyes of this prophet. It's interesting because when we think about a shepherd, we typically think about someone who is brave and strong, that is taking care of a group of wayward animals. We might even think of ourselves as sheep from time to time, and I don't want to get into that with you. That may be right. At least it is for me sometimes. Yet, A shepherd is not some omnipotent being. A shepherd can't actually save these animals. A shepherd is just a human being that is there to guide them along their way, but that shepherd can't stop predators. That shepherd can't stop sicknesses. That shepherd can't stop life from moving on. Instead, The shepherd guides with the sheep, moves along beside them, endures the same elements that these animals do. And that is perhaps the best thing that can happen. Because you see, that shepherd knows exactly what our struggle has been. That shepherd knows every step that we have taken because that shepherd took those same steps with us, gently guiding us toward a future of hope. 
But that existence, that image of a shepherd is one that is so vulnerable. It's one that admits that weaknesses and fear and doubt will be part of the journey, that struggles we encounter will threaten to overwhelm us, and yet we will not be deterred because God calls us to a stronger vision. So long as we lead with those fears, God is walking with us. What does this look like in real life? For so long we have used the language of strength when we think about how the church is operating or how we grow in our congregation, how we grow in our faith. We've talked about this in our Christmas light as well. We seek joy and happiness. And so many times that means that we need to completely ignore the things that have hurt us along the way. But today's stories tell us that we don't need to do that. That instead, when we lead with our vulnerability, this beautiful word that we use in church that literally means for us, when we lead with our truth, when we speak our truth, even the things that hurt us, that God's kingdom is big enough to hold those things. It's not pretending that everything is okay that makes the world a brighter place for us. It's acknowledging the things that seem to cause us pain and allowing others to lead us back with compassion with care. I met a woman earlier who called into our church office looking for assistance. She's a medical care provider who works for a very low wage in hospitals doing tasks that no one wants to do. And in the course of talking with her, she shared that the only thing she wanted for her family was to have gifts, to have some sense of normalcy in a year where everything had been destroyed. I met with her and we talked about her family. We talked about the hopes that she had. Together we cried about the things that had been lost this year. And we thought about what it meant to be looking for God in the midst of this. God's creation, the star that comes among us in this Christmas season. Together, through telling that story, we found holy ground. And we were able to help her with the gifts and kindness of this congregation, not because we needed to do that, but because we could. Because in the sharing of that truth, we saw God in our vulnerability. The thing that we have in common is the fact that we all encounter pain and suffering, and together we can look for a brighter future. These things matter because that is what we share with each other. And so today, on this second Sunday of Christmas, I want to end with a poem from Pesha Gertler called The Healing Time. Finally, on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I said no to my life. All the unintended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin and bones, those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again where I find them, the old wounds, the old misdirections. I lift them one by one close to my heart. And I say, holy, holy. My friends, God is with us in this time. God is with us through everything that we have encountered. If only we share that burden with each other we will truly find the gift of God in this Christmas.